we've been through an experience that is a shared experience that nobody else could really share that part. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all having a wonderful day today. My name is Talal, and you are listening to the Popcorn and Soda Podcast, the show where we discuss all things movies, pop culture, and so much more. I want to thank each and every one of you for making me a small part of your day. On today's show, we are joined by a very special guest. She is one of the original Five kids from the iconic pop culture film, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. She played everyone's favorite, lovable brat, Veruca Salt. With the movie celebrating a major milestone this year with its 50th year anniversary, it continues to find audiences through streaming and other platforms, cementing itself as one of the all-time great films, as well as inspiring the next generation of creatives. On the show today... Miss Julie Don Cole. How are you, Julie? I'm very well. Thank you for a, a very big build up, a wonderful welcome. <laughs> uh, hey, my pleasure. Thank you so much for coming to hang out on the show today. I, it really means a lot. Before we get started, how have you been this year? We're living in such a crazy world. What yeah. have you been doing to keep busy? Uh, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, well, I've been fine. I'm happy to say I've been well, as have all my family. Um, I, I'm now a psychotherapist, which you may or may not know. Um, but when this happened, um, the, the job that I was doing, I worked for a, a cancer charity. So we moved everything online and everything, you know, shifted pretty much overnight. Um, so I've been working flat out, you know, since March till now uh, online, uh, managing the service online. But, you know, it's it, we've been OK. I, I, I have a very nice house in the country and beautiful views and places to walk. So I'm a lot more fortunate than other people. Yeah. And I actually didn't know that. And that's great. Thank you so much for all that you do. Uh, definitely been a tough time for a lot of people. So, hey, here's hoping mm. to uh, a much smoother 2021 and hopefully we return to somewhat of a normal next year. Yeah. Well, as you as you said in your intro, you know, it's the 50th anniversary of Willy Wonka. And, and you know, we were really hoping to be able to do some 50th anniversary events, um, you know. Let's hope. Let's hope. These virtual calls and these virtual interviews are always great, but there's something so personable about being in person. And I know you've done the Comic-Con circuit a lot. It's that connection with the audience is just so massive. And I, and I know you're a big fan of that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's fun meeting people and hearing the stories. And it, it's actually a good excuse to get together with my, my fellow children. <laughs> <laughs> we always like seeing each other. 50 years of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Yep. The movie is so iconic till this day. And one thing that me selfishly watching this movie at a very young age, uh, it just opened my eyes to so many different universal themes, whether it's good versus bad, greed, mm -hmm. family, love. It's just so well done. So let's dive right into all things Wonka. So this was your very first movie. How did this all start? Did you want to be an actor growing up and specifically the audition process for the movie? How did that all come about? Well, I I hadn't, I, it wasn't something that I thought of growing up. You know, it's, um, you know, being an actor, an actress then was a bit like saying you want to be, you know, an astronaut. It was something that other people did. But I had a very good primary school teacher who was, you know, went up from the age of like, seven eight onwards and uh, she spotted something in me and suggested to my mother that I audition for a stage school theatre school um, we'd only done sort of you know school productions but um, I, I was getting kind of the lead parts and getting quite a good reaction so she obviously thought I was capable of it and so I auditioned for theatre school and I got in and I went, first of all, to uh, a school called Italia Conti. I was there for two or three months. Um, then I switched schools. I went to a different school. Um, I, my very first job was um, as Liza the Maid in a, uh, a London production of Peter Pan over Christmas with Hayley Mills. Hayley Mills was uh -huh. the, playing Peter Pan that year. Um, my absolute 
uh, childhood heroine. I, I, I adored Hayley Mills. And I remember walking in the first day of rehearsals and she was just ahead of me in a beautiful fur coat and uh, held the door open for me. And I was so stunned <laughs> that it was her that I just stood there transfixed to the spot and let the door was going to bang in my face. I think she's probably thought I was a bit weird. Um, anyway, that was my first job. And then um, I switched schools and uh, went to a different school that had a better reputation for, for work. Um, I went to Barbara Speak, who uh, uh, discovered Jack Wilde um, of Oliver and various other kids that were, you know, doing quite well. At the time. And but this time I was going for some auditions, yeah. you know, for TV, movies, other things, you know, and I wasn't getting any of them. Um, and it always came to the part where they would say, and tell us what you've been in. And I would say nothing. And then they'd say, thank you. Goodbye. So um, Willy Wonka was just another cattle call audition. Um, all the girls of the right age were marched into the hall. Uh, you, you, not you, you too tall, too old, too blonde, too dark, whatever it was, you know, just go away. And then, you know, I don't know, 20 of us were shortlisted and invited to come back. And then that shortlist was, you know, shortlisted again and that kind of process. So I don't know, there were maybe two or three castings. Then it got down to the sort of, you know, the nitty gritty. I think there were five of us at this point. And uh, the director, Mel Stewart, asked what I'd been in. And by now I'd wised up to the fact that if I said nothing, I would be shown the door. So I'm afraid I lied and I made up a bunch of stuff that I had not been in. Um, but I would kind of heard it and said I'd been in Oliver and I'd been in uh, another film. I, can't I just made them up <laughs> and um, I just figured he wouldn't find out. And if he did find out, he might give me the benefit of the doubt and think it was a bit Veruca. So I never did find out whether he did guess but um anyway i got away with it it's funny you brought that up that is something exactly veruca would do and who knows maybe even if he did find out like i'm sure he probably thought you know what it just makes it even that much better that i found the person i think he'd find it amusing if he if he had found out i don't know and of course it was easier to do then you know he didn't have the internet you know now you'd be found out in a second um but you know i got away with it but and it is it is quite veruca like <laughs> What's so important and what stands out so much to me and especially so many of us that have watched this movie is the chemistry you all have with different individuals in the movie. Yeah. For one, as a unit with the other four children, one individually with your parents, and then one with Mr. Wonka himself. So let's break those down. First one with all the other children. Here you guys are shooting in Germany. A lot of yours, this is your first big blockbuster movie, a multi-million dollar budget. How was it interacting with the other kids? And did you guys bond instantly or did it take a little bit of time? How did that all go? No, we did. I think we all got on really well. Um, I was, Peter was out there first. Charlie Bucket was out there first, you know, mm -hmm. like running around and newspapers throwing and all of that stuff. Um, and then I had, I was second out on location. I came out to record my song early. Um, so then Denise, we didn't all really meet properly until the first day of filming when we were outside the factory gates. That, that was the first thing that we actually all shot together. Uh, it, September. It was a beautiful sunny day, a little chilly. It was very exciting. I'd never been involved in anything like that before, you know, uh, you know, being picked up by your car. I still have the call sheet. I think I was picked up at like 7.15 or something. Um, it was terribly exciting. Um, the, the exterior of the chocolate factory was actually Munich Gasworks. So we were all, you know, bust out to Munich Gasworks. And that, I, suppose, I suppose that whole scene probably took a, a, a week to shoot or something. So met uh, Michael Bulner, who played Augustus then. And sadly, uh, Michael did not speak English back then. I mean, he was 12 and we didn't speak German either. So there wasn't really much communication with Michael. It was, you know, guten tag and uh, that was it. <laughs> Um, the basics, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and then Paris, who played Mike TV, was two years younger, so he was a little on the periphery. You know, when you're 11 and the others are nearly 13, there's a bit of a difference. And uh, and then, but there were other kids as well that um, the assistant director had his three boys on set. Uh, Billy, Bobby, and Timmy were out on location, and the director's uh, daughter and son were out there, and uh, the executive producer's son. So we were a bit of a family of kids. Um, I was the only British one. Um, so that was a, sometimes a little sad because when they had a classroom because, you know, they, they were enough of them to make up a class um, for the American education system. But me, I was just on my own with my chaperone stroke tutor. But no, we kids, we all got on really well. I, I would say 
Peter and Denise and and me and uh, Bobby Rowe were probably the tightest. Um, Bobby was also Charlie Bucket's stand-in and he had a couple of lines in the classroom scene. And so we would hang out together and, um, you know, we'd hang out at the hotel. Um, we were all, well, uh, Peter, Denise and I were staying in the same hotel. So, yeah, a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, that sounds awesome. And then shifting over to your on-screen dad, the late, great Roy Kinnear. Yeah. What was the interaction with Roy? And did you guys seem to find that balance of getting that chemistry together? Did you guys hang out, date some of these scenes together? He, he was lovely. I mean, all the kids kind of bonded with their parent and they kind of looked out for us. But Roy was um, so charming and he was also staying at the, the same hotel. Um, his wife came out to join. And I remember going... Um, with them for uh, weekend visits to Austria and places we'd go sightseeing together and he was just always absolutely delightful and charming and kind of he looked out for me I was the only kid there that didn't have uh, a, a parent with them um, I had my chaperone so he he sort of made it his business to look after me a little I think and uh, he was he was an absolute sweetheart you know and taught me lots of silly little tricks he used to he used to talk about his left hand loomer and he said what's that what's a left hand loomer he said oh well you know you, when you're standing there in the back of you know somebody else's shot if you just lean on your left a little bit you'll get your shoulder in somebody else's close up and that means you get overtime <laughs> <laughs> his left hand loomer or his right hand loomer just shift your weight and you'll be in the back of somebody else's shot you get more screen time <laughs> oh, that's classic and then of course lastly the legendary gene wilder his performance just leaps off the screen and especially with all the kids how the movie progresses what was his presence like on set just ordinary old gene um no special treatment no nothing you know especially when we're in the chocolate room i remember that particularly there'd be because that that took over a whole sound stage so there were no little corners where you were you know offset as it were it was all just chairs bundled into a corner and Gene and Jack and Roy would sit there telling stories. Jack would be doing, Jack Albertson would be doing his sort of vaudeville routines with his hat rolling up and down his arm. And they'd all be telling stories and jokes and Gene being absolutely generous and and kind and never, ever said, you know, go away, please, can I have quiet time? Which he must have wanted. <laughs> you know, you've got five kids on masses of sugar bouncing around all over the place, you know. Um, but he was, he was lovely. He... Um, he also, for my birthday, arranged for um, my, my birthday was actually shot um, whilst we were doing the Golden Goose scene. That was my birthday. Um, yeah. And um, ah. normally, you know, back in the day, you would have a black and white uh, stills photographer would come along, takes a, a set of black and white photos. But Jean arranged for a colour uh, photographer to, to come and take a set of colour photos for my birthday. And, and that was my my gift from Jean, which was a wonderful present. And it's something I'm extremely grateful for because, you know, I'm able to still send them <laughs> out to fans. So, you know, it was the gift that keeps on giving. And if you want to get those photos, you can now visit julie.co.uk and get your own photo. Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 well, that's great. Transitioning over to the production of the movie, here you are, this 13-year-old kid, and you've acted on so many different stage shows, but you're on this multi-million dollar set. What was day one like? Were there nerves? How did you combat that? Was it a unit where things made it better and easier for you? How did that go? Um, well, day one was actually the recording of my song. That was the first thing I did. So that was in a massive, great music studio somewhere in Munich. I forget where with, you know, an orchestra and all of that going on. So that was quite daunting. Then I remember visiting the studio for the first time and seeing Peter filming his um, I've Got a Golden Ticket number. That was the first thing I saw. But of course, I'd never been on a film set before and I didn't understand why there were only three walls. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, OK, <laughs> camera's the fourth wall. Um, so that was quite interesting. And then they put the other wall in to do the other angle. I was thinking, oh, that's so clever. And that cottage looks so realistic and everything. It was fantastic. And then, you know, filming, as I said, the first bit we did was outside the um the factory waiting to go in which wasn't wasn't so you know that wasn't so difficult I think the next thing we probably filmed was that black and white room where we were all being squashed and squished and I do remember forgetting my lines in that and getting really upset because Mel Stewart was uh, shouting and going you know cut 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 who had the line and it was kind of me but my head was being squashed by Mrs Gloop and Mr Beauregard and what have you at the time so it was understandable but I was I was a bit mortified that I forgot my line 
How long was that whole production, and specifically your time on the movie? Was it a long shoot? Was it long days? Um, I was on it for about twelve weeks.、Uh, Peter was on it for longer.、Um, so yeah, twelve weeks, sort of counting. You know, and, and also had to rehearse at weekends. I had to rehearse the choreography for the song,、um, which I felt somewhat miffed about often because everybody else would be off doing fun things. It's like, no, you've got to rehearse on Saturday. Like, <laughs> Um, so yeah, I was on it for three months.、Um, yeah, it was a it was a lot of fun, but it was also I was homesick.、Um, you know, I was away from home for three months. I'd never been away from home before.、Um, it wasn't kind of thing that you did then. You know, in, in my we didn't do sleepovers. Right. You know, my kids always did sleepovers and you know went on school visits and things, but we never did. <laughs> so I think I'd, I'd barely stayed with my grandmother <laughs> overnight. You know, that was about it. So yeah, I was homesick at times.、Um, couldn't telephone as we would now, and couldn't email as we would now. You know, I'd have to write a letter by longhand and post it, and that would be you know two weeks before it got to my mother, and then she'd spend a couple of days writing back. So you know, I was lucky if I got. Got, you know, three or four letters during the time I was there. Fully understandable, especially again how far we've come as technology's progressed.、Yeah. With computers, email, phone calls. It was a different time back then, and it's just testament to your credit where it's tough being on a set, especially away from family. Well, I'm happy that you guys had this parental unit on set slash a family with all the children that it probably made things a lot easier. I think that's probably why we have the lasting friendships that we've had because that three months that we were together was very intense. You know, we we didn't have TV. You know, there was German TV, but we didn't speak German. <laughs> so you know, you you couldn't sit and watch a movie or something.、Um, so we made our own entertainment and got up to all sorts of mischief.、Um, you know, I don't know. Remember sitting striking matches for want something better to do. I mean, how we didn't set fire to the hotel, I don't know. But there we go. That's what we did.、Um, and just you know, being kids, but.、Um, That's probably why the the friendships are what they are, and we've you know we've been through an experience that is a shared experience that nobody else could really share that part of. So there's three specific scenes that I want to get your insight from because you were a big part of those three scenes. The first one being the initial introduction to the chocolate room. The whole pure imagination scene. Now, being a kid, going onto a big set like that, what was that like? And there's so many stories that I read online over the years that scene of them filming you guys walk in was your initial reaction to seeing the set for the first time. Is that true? And how was that experience overall? Well, it's true for four of them, but unfortunately, or fortunately, not true for me.、Um, in true Veruca style. Um, but you know, in my defence, it, it was just kind of an accident, and because I was out there, you know, costume fittings and that kind of thing, and, and recording my song,、uh, I remember Harper Goff, the set designer, when they were building and constructing that set, saying, "Oh, do you want to look around?" So I'm like, "Yeah, of course I do." <laughs> so he showed it to me. It wasn't finished, you know. I could see that there was a river, and I could see where things were going to be,、um, but it wasn't finished by any means. And so I had a, a look. And then, you know, barely a few days or maybe a week later or something, Mel Stewart said, "On no account were the children to see that chocolate room、um, before the shooting." He wanted our initial reaction. Well, too late, you know. I'd I'd already seen it, so I'm afraid I just kept quiet.、Um, I didn't tell him I'd already seen it. I did tell him. About ten years ago, when we were in New York, and、uh, you know, he was telling the story again about how the kids were never allowed to see it, and that was their first reaction. I thought I can't let this lie go on any longer. I went, Mel, Mel, I have to own up. I confess, I did see the set before we were allowed to, but I didn't know I wasn't supposed to. You were definitely meant to play Veruca Salt, definitely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Veruca always goes first. Always goes first. But it was an amazing set, and you know, that's what everybody wants to know and and hear that it was incredible. Incredible, you know. So th- being on the set and going down those steps and being able to run around, you know, that was the first time that we did all that. And they just kind of said, you know, run where you like, you know, maybe go in this direction, maybe go in that direction, just run and have a look at things. So we all just went running.、Uh, the little bit of business that Denise and I invented on the steps—that was us. You know, we were deciding to push and shove each <laughs> other a bit,、um, and Mel Stewart liked that, so he kept that in and 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 broadened that a little bit as well. So it was just—it was a very beautiful set, and I'd not seen it. You know, in its entirety, with the waterfall going and when the boat comes through and all of that, so that was wondrous. It really was. Now, was anything actually edible on that set, or was that just movie magic at its finest? 
a lot of the stuff that you see us eating in close up, you know, that was edible. They would switch it in, um, you know, uh, but the things like Denise's gummy bear, you know, they would substitute the ear, but not the whole bear. Um, that would be like a hundred pounds of gummy bear, wouldn't it? I think, um, you know, and the sort of cream in the, in the toadstool and that, I, the thing that I had to eat was that horrible watermelon stuffed with whatever chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't nice. That was horrible. Didn't like that. Cold, wet, slimy, chocolate flavored. Yuck. Didn't like it. <laughs> now, on the topic of the waterfall, I've read a lot that it was either just water with food coloring, but I've also read that they actually put some cocoa in there and it started to stink after a while. Yeah, they did. They, they couldn't just put food coloring in because it would just go kind of, you know, translucent. You need that opaqueness to it that, that chocolate has. So um, I think it was like a chocolate ice cream powder that they put in to, to kind of get it the right, you know looking like the right thing but of course we were on that set for probably I don't know three weeks or something and you know the hot lights and all of that and it got a little and it, I think also people did tend to use it like as a garbage tray you know they chuck their coffee cup dregs in it and things like that and you know it was the, in the days when people would smoke and then you know I remember seeing the old cigarette butt float down that, <laughs> that river so and we, we came in on a Monday I think it was and it had gone a little bit stinky and bubbly over the weekend so they had to drain it down and mix it and then they refilled it all again so we got a little bit of time off which was fun and uh, but then when they filled it again it wasn't quite the right color so they had to drain it down and mix it up again to get it the right color so yeah it was uh, yeah it wasn't wasn't a river that you really want to drink now talking about rivers transitioning over to that infamous boat scene me watching that scene as a kid i'm just like what the heck this movie just took a huge turn because here you have this guy in wonka who's this lovable chocolatier and then you have this dark yeah. scene how was it filming that was it creepy filming that scene or just what was mel trying to tell you guys on how to react well he he as ever with everything he just kind of let us all do what we would do and and hopefully shot it and got it the first time or near enough and then we do cut-ins um but we didn't know that gene was going to do that mm, insane performance we had no idea that that was going to happen um but you know so once you see him you know screaming and you know crazy eyes and hair going and mad you know it was just mad so, but yeah the first time I remember Denise saying she said they're saying this is a kids movie <laughs> so it was a but you know again a, like a lot of movie things you know first time round, it's like whoa that was interesting and then you just have to try and recreate it and we were the boat was raised up on um, like ladders, um, you know, like 20 foot in the air or something. We had to get up into the boat on a ladder so that they had room to project behind us. So once you were in that boat, you were stuck there until they said break. So, you know, it was pretty boring sometimes. <laughs> How many times do you guys shoot that Gene Wilder going crazy screaming scene? A few, um, you know, and then various cutaways and things. So we had to look at that terrible stuff being projected, you know, chickens and centipedes and whatever else. And I'm sure there were other things that didn't make the final Slugworth's cut. Slugworth's face popping up. Yeah, all, that, yeah. yeah all of that. Yeah. So we, we had that going on all day. We were probably on that for like two or three days, I should think. So in between the takes, was Gene like making sure everyone's all good or was he just, you know, business as usual, keeping it professional and just going on to the next take? You know, he was, you know, he's fine. I mean, there'd be chats and then, you know, you come out of it. Um, yeah. And, you know, Roy would be having a little chat about, you know, he used to have a poem that he used to tell me, um, a silly poem um, called, I don't know what it was called, actually. He used to do it. Now you've heard of Hiawatha. If you have not, do not bother. You can read it in The Wizard for yourself. And his wee wife, Minnie, ha, 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 ha. And he just used to start laughing. And that set me off because he had such a wonderful laugh. And I would make him do it again and again and again gain poor man oh that, that's sweet now transitioning from the boat scene to the infamous i want it now scene and <laughs> this whole movie it's another one bites the dust each scene there's another thing that comes up with one kid then to another and personally i just love the veruca scene because a your full bratness was in full display you were definitely showing the true side of veruca when you wanted the golden goose just as you mentioned earlier you had recorded the song much before everything yeah how difficult was the choreography in shooting that scene and just overall what do you remember the most about that 
Um, yeah, I, well, it was it was tricky song. You know, it was a tricky song to sing. It's if anybody's yeah, who who has tried it and knows, you know, it's syncopated rhythm and key changes, and it did have some different lyrics originally. Um, they didn't work so well, so I think the lyrics were changed two or three times. Um, and then the choreography. You know, it's one thing. You know, it says you know she hits the ribbons well the ribbons don't always behave as though you want them to behave you know there'd be a sort of little <laughs> limp spill over the edge or something or the the cellophane round Mr Wonka's neck you know just ended up you know sticking on his nose or something silly you know but, you, know, you could all the you know spinning the cart at the boxes and then they just didn't go where they were supposed to go so a lot of that stuff you know took time and and orchestration to get right so uh and a lot of energy actually doing it I so I do remember the from the cellophane round Wonka's neck onwards with the ribbons and the kicking and the cart and the everything else. That was probably the longest sequence I've done in my life with 36 takes, 36. Yeah. Wow. So that was, that was quite something. And, you know, and then of course you, you're trying to, you know, get the lip sync perfect as well. And there'd be times when it's like, yeah, it just wasn't quite right. So, but yeah, it was, it was, um, it was a hard scene to do. So again, I think it probably took the best part of a week to shoot it all in all. Oh, wow, that's really interesting there. Now, that scene with the trap door where Ruka stands on there and mm -hmm. it says bad egg. How did you guys do that? Was it like a trap door with a little like cushion at the bottom? Because it looked like a pretty deep fall. Like yeah, it was. It was, you know, my height and a bit more. Um, so, you know, from where I was standing during most of the song up to the you know that's a solid floor that's the studio floor and then you know you go up a few steps and things so you can you can sort of guess the height and it's tall enough to hide mr uh, mr salt when he goes down as well mm -hmm. um so it's a fair old drop you know there were some cardboard boxes and mattresses underneath me to break my fall but you know if you think of it you know hitting your mark um and i only ever did it once um you know whilst singing and not looking down um, I had to hit my spot absolutely dead centre because if I wasn't dead centre, I'd either topple forwards and hit my forehead on the thing or backwards hit my head or, or my arms. So you had to hit the spot absolutely dead centre and then not put your arms out, which is your automatic re reflex. Yeah, it's like your natural reaction. Yeah. yeah, you put your arms out to save yourself. So it's like, oh, OK, how's this going to go? Because anyway, I got to do it once. It worked perfectly. And that was it. We didn't do it again. Beautiful. One time's a charm. That's it. Yep. Another topic everyone just loves the Oompa Loompas. Now, <laughs> what was it like, especially in that scene? And then just even in general, getting to work with these great actors that were portraying these Oompa Loompas. What was your first reaction to seeing them? Um, well, I met them, first of all, in makeup. So I saw the, the makeup test, you know, orange faces and green hair. And I remember writing home to my mother saying, you know, describing what I'd seen. Um, so, yeah, they were just a, a bunch of characters. And they I, there were 10 of them, all in all, nine men and one woman. And they were cast from all over Europe. Um, circuses and various other traveling shows and that kind of thing so we had a turkish guy we had a, a french lady we had a german uh, quite a few brits um yeah they were maltese so they, they were all nationalities and all with different skills some were you know professional actors and had been and others not so much you know um but they were all funny they were funny um still friends very much with Rusty Goff who's one of the the main Oompa Loompas I think he was one of the youngest at the time he would have been like 22 or something then um so I'm still friends with him and he cracks me up every time he's just very funny person very funny person but they were also a little mischievous they were they they partied quite hard those little Oompa Loompas <laughs> there were many times when um, we come in and they were a little bit hungover. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that's funny. Now, what would you say is one story or one memory that still sticks out to you till this day about the shoot? Uh, I, I wish I could pick one and I can't. Uh, okay. I really a couple. pick one. I could, you know, we, we've mentioned many of them um i just think the whole thing because every day there was something different going on um you know the thing that i take from the movie most of all is the, the friendships uh, you know we've we the kids are now you know we call ourselves the kids it's 50 years on um but we still are you know friends um you know when we see each other we fall into our old patterns our old habits um and you know that is that is what the everlasting thing of that that film is for me and and the the memories that it's created for other people as well so all the you know people that tell me what it meant to them and their families and some of the doors it's open for me you know I've had a great time doing some 
fun stuff because of it. So uh, yeah, it's it's just I, I couldn't separate out one bit. I honestly couldn't. Of course, I like all the scenes I was in, but. Um... <laughs> <laughs> and as you mentioned, you've had a very illustrious career in the creative arts. After this movie, the movie comes out. Does life change overnight? Or was it a couple of years before you started to really notice that, hey, this Wonka thing that I did is really reflecting in some of the opportunities that I'm getting? Well, it was many, many years later, because when the movie came out, it was not a box office success. So it bombed, in other words. Um, you know, movies were measured by how long they stayed at your local movie theatre. And this came and went within like three weeks. Um, people didn't understand it. And, you know, I've got kept some of the clips, the reviews that said uh, it's fun, but not very funny. Um, and described it as a kind of like a nightmare Walt Disney or something, they said. I can't remember what it was. It was something like that. They, they, they were not favourable at all. So it disappeared. Um, both Peter and I were offered uh, multi-picture deals afterwards um, to do three more movies with Walker Pictures, but they never made another movie. So that was the end of my options. <laughs> um, so that didn't happen. And then, you know, I went back to school. It disappeared. I did some TV. Um, I, I did more TV while I was at school, a couple of other bits and pieces of things but it was very much forgotten um and it wasn't until the 80s i would say uh oof, yeah late 80s mid 80s late 80s when it started to have this revival and you know the next generation were watching it on tv and they got it right. you know the people watching it on tv got it and they understood the darkness of it and um you know the movies in you know 1971 you don't kill children <laughs> <laughs> it's not the dumb thing and to have horrible children and if you think it was you know mary poppins and bed knobs and broomsticks and chitty chitty bang bang and, and the sound of music or night. yeah exactly all with lovely children and then you've got these four hideous ones you know so that was just people didn't quite know what to make of it so it was the 80s when it started to have its cult status i think and then we'd all as kids we'd lost touch with each other you know pigeon post and promising to write you know doesn't happen um and I think it was 90, you know, 90s almost before I began to really realise. And uh, a, a guy named Gene Crowell, um, who's a bit of a super fan, tracked us all down and we got invited to do a con, a comic con in or, um, New Jersey, uh, Chiller Theatre, um, which they do every Halloween. And that was the first I ever knew about conventions and what happens and the craziness of it. And well, that was my first interaction of fans. And I saw... Paris again and Peter and didn't see Denise I think that first year I think it was Peter Paris and myself in like 90 I think I, I would want to say 96 97 so you know courtesy of the internet we were able to be found again as you mentioned this movie has this way of just it attracts so many new generations and it's got this cult like following where it's every like yeah. 10 years it kind of reinvent itself and there's a new generation of people that are being exposed to either the books the movie, just a testament to how far, and, and I think maybe at the time when it first came out, maybe it just, it some, some things click, some things don't, but over time, it just really shows how... It's bizarre, you know, and I'm, I'm particularly, you know, reminded of it every Halloween, because there will be somebody that dresses up <laughs> as Veruca Salt, um, and I've oh, yeah. seen Dolly Parton dressed as Veruca Salt in that red dress, and Sharon Osbourne this year, and... Um, Oh, gosh. Anyway, I, I forget, you know, but there have been many. Um, yeah, um, Josh Grogan. Um, it, it's just been extraordinary to see the impact, you know, and you've only, for me, you know, that that red dress, people see that and they get, ah, Veruca Salt. It's, it's iconic, you know, who would have thought that? Is red your favourite colour now or is it just like, oh. Become a bit of a theme. <laughs> With the movie continuously reinventing itself in so many ways, Netflix recently announced that it's doing two new animated movies with claim director Taika yeah. Waititi. If they were to come to you, Miss Julie Don Cole, would you be interested in voicing one of the characters? Would you like to revisit it? I would kill to do that. I would kill to be a newspaper reporter or anything, <laughs> especially uh, Taika Waititi. I love his work, um, Jojo Rabbit and uh, Boy and In Search of the Wilder People. I yeah. love his work. I think he's so so talented so i'm really happy that he's going to do it and then i'm sure he'll do a great job i'm sure he'll do a great job 
yeah, Taika Watiti, if you're listening, bring back some OGs. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, please, please, Taika. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be anything. <laughs> <laughs> Another movie I wanted to ask your opinion on was the 2005 reimagining slash reboot of the movie Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. What were your thoughts on that? Overall, did you think that they did enough to make it contemporary or did you feel it was more so a more direct adaptation of the book? I don't think we are the best people to ask that because, you know, I have such a strong image in my head of what it should be because that's been my childhood. Um, I There were parts I liked and parts I didn't like quite so much. Um, I loved the exterior of the factory and I thought that was great, very sort of Lowry looking and I did that. Yeah. Then, uh, you know, I'm not sure about Wonka being quite as weird as the Johnny Deppisms that he had in the (laughs) you know I think if you come back to what Roald Dahl wrote he wrote a story about four dysfunctional children and one good boy and how Mm -hmm. you know if you're a good nice person good things will come to you that's the that's the essential message of the movie which yeah I I I think that got somewhat lost Yeah, that's fair and then that's interesting you have that perspective because especially what I've noticed is when we're children and we are exposed to certain things, like for me, this movie has completely changed my life in so many different ways and made me want to be in the creative arts and how you had that experience as a child that you're so like attached. You hold it near and dear to your heart. So I, I fully understand your perspective on that. Mm, I, and then that's, you know, we, we, it's, it's something we, we do care passionately about all of us. And we've all been, you know, very, uh, protective of the brand <laughs> um you know and, and and want to see it honored and respected so you know and I love the fact that ours has continued in many ways it did us a favor because everybody thought oh well you know okay we've had you know 30 good years at th- that point or whatever it was and you know Johnny Depp and Tim Burton great combination that's gonna you know be amazing but it sort of annoyed people to a certain extent and people got quite yeah. passionate about it and um and then you know I, I'm you know when I'm at conventions now I meet people and they say you know oh, I, I couldn't stand it I wanted my kids to see the proper version they need to see the real version so kind of ignited interest in in the old movie lastly I want to transition over to another special anniversary for you and uh, that we're celebrating this year and that's the 10-year anniversary of your memoir of life on set of Willy Wonka <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for that. Yes. Um, I made that decision, you know, as you say, 10 years ago. Um, My mother had kept all the letters that I wrote home and uh, we put them together in a book with um, a guy co wrote it with Michael Esslinger, who's a very good author and has written lots of books about Alcatraz, if anybody's interested. They're fantastic books. He's a great historian, but he's a passionate follower of Wonka and really wanted to do this book. So he kind of pushed and we did it together. And it was something really for my children um so that you know the little bits of information get lost don't they you forget things and so you know finding those letters that my mother produced was fantastic it jogged my memory on lots of things so that was in there thinking now about maybe it's time to update it um because there's been a lot of stuff that's happened in the last 10 years um so I'm talking to Michael about doing an update for for this year if we can get our act we've been saying this for a while now but I think we will do it um, I need to put in, you know, a chapter because sadly Denise is no longer with us. So that was a very sad uh, point in our lives that, you know, we lost one of us and, you know, the last year of her life was not great um, and we miss her dearly. And, you know, all the other crazy stuff that I've been able to do since and the doors that it's opened, you know, I went to South Africa making some um, videos there, which was basically a sort of travel viral commercial thing you know if it's good enough for Veruca it's good enough for you so I had a marvelous time you know on a, on a game reserve and um, various other things my friend Rob Newman whose father was the executive producer on it and he was one of the kids hanging around at the time remained a firm friend he called me and said would you like to come to Obama's inauguration next week? I went, yes, please. So, you know, the stories about the inauguration and Rusty Goff, our lovely Oompa Loompa, got married last year in Thailand and uh, I attended his wedding in Thailand. So there's a, there's a few things that I think people might still like to hear. Yeah, of course. And and as you mentioned, like getting a chance to sit down and seeing those letters, it, it probably rekindled a lot of memories that you probably didn't even remember you really had, especially with just sitting down and really focusing on it. What was the overall experience of writing a book like? 
was it more difficult than what you thought or was it it was easier than I thought really because all the memories were there and they came kind of spilling out and then once you start you know and I I traveled over to um work with Michael Esslinger face to face we we worked together and then he'd ask a question and I go la, la, la. oh yeah I forgot that oh I've forgotten that oh I'd forgotten that and so a whole load of detail came out that I'd I'd forgotten perfect as we wrap up here with Miss Julie Don Cole it is now time for the final act Miss Cole <laughs> I'm going to ask you a series of rapid fire questions about your likes okay. and dislikes Answer with the first thing that comes to mind. Don't worry about any time limits. We're just gonna we're gonna get your thoughts. Okay, this bit's made me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go nice and slow. Okay. And if you want to pass on a question, feel free to pass. Okay. First thing that comes into my head, right? Yep. You got it. <laughs> Movies or TV shows? What do you prefer more? Movies. Theater or watch at home? <laughs> watch at home. What's one sequel better than the original? Ah, uh, none. All right, fair answer. Best trilogy of all time. Best trilogy. Ooh, 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 Jurassic Park. Ah, oh, it's a good one. Should Hollywood reboot Back to the Future? No. Favorite horror movie? Psycho. And Carrie. No, can I have both? I'm allowed both. <laughs> <laughs> all right, fair enough. We'll give you both. Summer or fall? Fall. Does pineapple belong on pizza? I don't like pizza. Whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. That's the first time I've ever heard that. Been such an awesome guest. We're going to let that one just slide, all right? <laughs> now, we're going to transition more into some Wonka questions. Okay. Do you still have any props or souvenirs from the set? I have my script. I have my original 1971 poster. And I have a um, scrumpedly umptious bar. When was the last time all five of you were together? Uh, that would have been in Phoenix, four of us, I think. Probably all there, four of us. Before that, Florida. Before that, Florida, and that would be like five years ago. Uh, the last time three of us were together, that's Michael, sorry, Peter, um, Charlie, and uh, Paris, Mike TV, and myself. We, we were in, um, well, wherever we were, Boston, launching a pinball machine. <laughs> all right, there you go. Gene Wilder or Johnny Depp? Again, biased question, but... Ah, do I even have to ask? Wow. <laughs> Wilder. Favorite part about the shoot? Chocolate room. Worst part about shoot? Eating that chocolate stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Does a day go by where the name Veruca Salt is not mentioned in your life? Yes, Lee. Yes. Guess. <laughs> Closest friend from the movie till this day? Rob Newman. Describe the movie in one word. Magical. Beautiful. We made it through the act. <laughs> Julie, thank you for your honesty on that. Again, I'm really considering if I should edit out that pizza answer or not, but hey, <laughs> we'll leave that in. <laughs> <laughs> I know. A person that doesn't like chocolate or pizza, that's very strange, isn't it? And you were in a movie called Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, where can we find you online? I'm JDC, the original Veruca Salt, um, and I have a Facebook page, so you can you can friend me on my Facebook page, JDC, the original Veruca Salt. You can now purchase I Want It Now, a memoir of life on the set of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory at juliedoncole.co.uk, where you can get a signed and personalized copy, as well as bookstores and Amazon worldwide. Julie, thank you so, so much for being a guest on the show today. Thank you. And thank you for your contributions to the creative arts. Like so many others, this movie deeply impacted my life. And that's largely due to your performance in it. Being a kid and watching this movie, moving to a new country, and this uh -huh. is the first thing I watched. It just opened my eyes and it, it made me believe that I can literally accomplish anything I want. So thank you so much. I'll give you a couple of sign outs. So I'll give you my favorite line. Snozberry? Who ever heard of a snozberry? <laughs> and then I'll give you a little bit because people... You might want to hear it. Gooses, geeses, I want my geese to lay gold eggs for Easter. At least a hundred a day. And by the way. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Julie, thank you so much. Please stay safe. And you know what? Hey, hopefully when the world opens up, we can have a chance to do this in person. That would just be magical. That would be lovely. Thank you, Talal. It's been a joy.